Good morning, everybody. I'm going to get started. My name is Todd with MadeOpen.com. Is the uh, sound all right out there? Yep. Yeah. All right. Looks like we did our chairs uh, didn't meet their expectations with the number of people, but I appreciate everybody coming out this morning. And um, I'm going to get started by talking about capitalism, um, why we have it, what the need for it is, and what we need to do as a people to to move forward in a direction that makes a little more sense to uh, to everybody here and everyone we know and love. So to get started, basically capitalism and, and government are just two systems that we as people created. This is nothing that we were, we happen to be born with it, but this is nothing that was here before we got here. We as people created these systems. And why do we create systems? Well. We have a need, we have several needs, and we solve problems through systems. It's the way we think. And through time, these systems have been created. Capitalism through the market solves problems. There's studies on, on capitalism and markets and supply and demand. But I'm looking here at more of a fundamental, fundamental need for these systems. And what I see is, that markets solve people's problems. And when mar markets can't solve somebody's problem, that's, well, that's where we create governments. Governments step in to take care of the problems that markets cannot or do not solve. Well, why wouldn't a market solve a problem? If we look at capitalism, we can see that the answer to this is pretty evident, where capitalism being defined as a socioeconomic system, where goods and services are produced for profit, we see right there that the very definition of capitalism is for profit. If corporations don't see profit, they don't do business there. So we continue to have problems that the market doesn't solve. So we need other systems and we create governments. So my premise here is to, to start out by saying that let's not try, if we can, if we can all agree here and please We'll stop right now if anybody, you know, and we have a discussion, if anybody doesn't agree that to some level corporations don't control the government, um, that's a, I mean, that's a fundamental assumption that I'm, that I'm making is that, that we can agree that without corporations, governments will act a little more efficiently. And a lot of the problems that we have created by these two systems are problems that are not people problems. These are problems that have been given to us by these institutions. So to say that, it's not to say that we don't need government or their corporations are bad, these are just systems that we have people have, we've created to solve these problems. So what I want to do to, is fundamentally get at what, what, what is, as people, what do we want? What do we need? What are we looking to do? You know, we have these systems, but these are old systems. You know, these are, these are systems that are, great, great relatives, you know, created at some point in time to solve a problem. Corruption has entered over time and, um, but again, I try to stay away from those topics of, of corruption because if we can just agree that um, we can attack capitalism here and play the game of capitalism, that the, some of the government things will, those will shake themselves out and we won't have to focus our attention there and some problems will just disappear. And so what I want to talk about is, the, is, is our problems. What do, what do we have as problems as people? We have, we have needs, we have desire, <clears throat> excuse me, we have fundamental needs and desires, um, food, clothing, shelter. We have needs of safety, which enters in the whole idea of currency, because what is currency but just a futures of something that you want or need? If you didn't want or need anything in the future, you certainly wouldn't have a need for currency. So I want us to start thinking about where are we going? Because I don't think many people are asking that question. We're all caught up in our day-to-day -day stuff and our heads are down and we work extremely long hours and, and you know, what, what does this give us in the end? Where are we going? And if we lift our heads up for a second, where, where do we want to be? And we have to make a simple assumption that 
we're automating more and more and more stuff. And when that stuff gets automated down this path that we're headed down now with our heads down, you know, we eventually get that pink slip, we get laid off, automation. It's going to solve our problems, but not our problems at this rate, corporations' problems. So what we have in the end is we have fully automated corporations. We have several people standing outside these corporations saying, we want your goods or services. And the corporations are saying, yeah, remember that costs money. And we say, well, we don't have any jobs anymore. And the point is not to have that discussion. The point is to say, forget that discussion. Let's talk about what we want and need, assuming that we're going to automate everything. Because I, I mean, I think that's a simple assumption to make that at some point in the future, whether it's five or 500 years, that we're going to fully automate everything. So if we think about that as a people and say, okay, how do we control that automation? Because clearly the way we're doing it now is not going to result in the people owning this automation. So, and again, w down that path, nothing, nothing, I don't believe anything good is there. I mean, we could talk for an hour about how we take this thing back when everything is fully automated and whether it's redistribution or wealth or uh, the, all the you know, revolution, everything that could possibly happen. Let's not get there. Let's be smarter than the people before us, right? Because after all, isn't this really about the future? Isn't this about our children and our children's children? Because at the end of the day, I'm not working so that my bank account can be a certain size so that my kids smile when I die saying, oh good, I got some money. I'm, I'm looking to make this place better. I'm looking to make this place better in some substantial ways. So what would a system look like? What would everyone here be happy with? And that's a, you know, we're really talking some ideologies and to me, the most simple answer to that question is to ask people, what do you want and need? And what are you willing or able to do? Now, with these two questions, these are fundamental questions. And I don't think, you know, good or bad people, it's not the answers don't have to be the same, but the questions. It's that those questions fundamentally um, resonate with people no matter what because it's about them. It's about the individual. It's not about the entire collective. We're asking you, what do you want and need? Just tell us. Because, I mean, I would certainly rather be working in a system where I knew what people want and needed and these things were measurable. And then the other side of it is, what are you willing or able to do? Now, we do have, we have not automated everything yet. So we do have to live in this in this world that we that we still live in where not everything is automated. So what do we do? We need to figure out a way to still solve problems up until the point of automation. But again, it's, it's, to get the, it's to get that vision. It's to get that collective vision that says, okay, we know there's this point we want to reach where everything's automated and we just kind of get everything that we need and we can kind of focus on whatever we want because everything's automated so we can do whatever we want to do. So it's not to really focus on what that vision would look like out there, but to say what its fundamental requirements would be. And I believe that these are two columns, you know, wants and needs and can and or, or willing and able to do's. And when people are able to say what they are willing and able to do, people do amazing things. We're not, we're not at a loss for people doing amazing things in this world. We're at a loss for direction. We're at a loss for people doing amazing things because that's what they, you know, they're doing them because they're, they get the self-benefit, not the, the benefit of humanity. So if we, if we look at those things, how, what, what are these things? What are these things that, um, that we can, how do we arrange these things that we want and need? And I believe to have that discussion, we need to be talking about the only resource in human history that has not been able to be, to be controlled by force. So you can't physically control data like you can physically control oil or land or water. So we're constantly creating 
this resource called data. And we don't stop creating this resource. This resource, we, we continue to create. And we don't create it in a, in a static way, we, in, in a linear fashion in growth. It's exponential. You know, what, what else are we going to be collecting? It's not just data like location or pictures. This is medical information. I mean, we're at the macro level, there's not really a lot to collect. We have, we keep collecting more and more about ourselves, but w why? What are we going to do with all this data? Well, it's not us at this point that's doing anything with that data that's, that's productive. It's corporations. And they're just getting a glimpse into what we're all about, into what we do. And they're already calling it big data. What's next? Right? I mean, after big data, what comes? Huge data, it just doesn't, it's not, you know, it's not something that, it should be big data small. It should be big data personal, right? And we have a lot of talk about data these days. And I, I want to take, a, take a, uh, a few minutes right now to talk about what data is because there's a lot of talk about data privacy. But the one thing that is assumed when the word data privacy comes out of somebody's mouth is they've assumed you don't own your data. Because the conversation that ends all conversations about data privacy is the conversation about data ownership. You know, they're not on CNN and Fox talking about, you know, how data privacy, where, you know, what do the people do with this? How do they control it? It's not, because it's not the people's, it's theirs. It's the corporations, it's their data, it's not our data. Because if it was our data, we wouldn't need to talk about privacy. You know, we don't talk about, you know, geez, I hope the, the mortgage broker that sold me this house doesn't come, on and come in the house and make him a sandwich, make himself a sandwich in the middle of the night. I mean, these, we have certain things that we have to assume that we have the rights to. And that privacy through ownership is one of them. And if we're not assuming that we have those rights, then we have, you know, there's much bigger issues. That those are personal liberties. Those are personal freedoms. Whereas these are not, these are, what they're talking about are just simple terms of service, terms of use. And what we need to do is refocus on, you know, ownership. So what is data? We have this notion of data being video, pictures, or images, audio, and text. Yet we have four data types, but somehow we have thousands of services all there to share four data types. Does that make any sense to anybody here that we have thousands of services that your data is spread over at least tens of services per person here where your data is all over the place but you only have four data types? It, it, it makes absolutely no sense to me. I mean I understand why and the definition of data I think will clarify that in, in a few different ways. Those four data types I talk about, those aren't, that's not all of data. That's all of what we store as data or past data. And I believe there's three tenses when it comes to data. You have past, present, and future. And I don't, to my knowledge, there's nobody talking about three tenses of data. And the reason is your past data is what you as a person, you feel this, uh, this emotional attachment to your past data because that's what you did. That's where you were. That's what, you know, those are pictures. That's, and I'm the same way. And that's very valuable to us. But at the same time, we understand as a people that it's more important to live in the moment, that right now is more important than what happened last week. But we still want that stuff. We still need that stuff. And our, our present data is called our attention. Okay, so if I have your attention now, I have your most valuable form of data. Now you might want to believe that your pictures of the past are worth more, but right now, this is all that makes a purchasing decision when a corporation looks at data, it's your attention. It's the only thing that makes that click happen because if a pop-up comes up and a better deal appears, that transaction's gone. Your attention never met your future data, which is your intention to do something. So with these three tenses of data, past, present, and future, what, what are these to a corporation? What are they, what, how do they value them? And I'll use Facebook an ex as an example just because they're the biggest and, and I don't like them very much. Um, they're basically, 
allowing you to put your past data somewhere. This is a very inexpensive resource to store. We all know this. But why would they store something for us? It's so that we come back, right? So that our intention is to come back so that they have our attention. And when you see when these three different things, if you start to look in your da daily lives and figure out what, what are these three tenses of data, how do they apply to me? Because I am a data creator and that's the way we need to look at it. You know, these are data points that don't exist without people. So if you're gonna be creating your own data, past, present, and future, how do we do it? How do we manage it? Because Facebook, you know, they certainly have a, all of them do, they want your data for the sole reason that you're gonna come back. If, you're not, if you don't have that intent to come back, that's it. Their value is gone. You know, if everybody had no intention to return to Facebook tomorrow, what would the stock do? It would, it would have little to no value because it's about people's intention. And people don't realize the value of this intention. And that's where I really want to focus our efforts is on capturing your intent and your attention in order to compete in this game that we've inherited. I believe that we can compete within capitalism to have companies that are run by people that create automated things, that do automated things, that, that play in the market. But in the end, they're responsible to the people because that's not what we have now. We, and we all know this and you know, we have government officials telling us that we can't get anything done here, we can't do anything. And we as the people say, well, that's your job. But they say that's your job as a people to direct us. So we're at this standstill where nobody knows what to do. We have too many, you know, I see at the midpoint of my life, I see the, look back and, and see the generations coming and these are some smart people. And I believe that I already need, I feel like I already need to get out of the way. And one of the biggest problems we have in corporations and government is simply greed. It's the, it's the inability to get out of the way. Let things move on. Let's, let, just let it progress. And they, they can't do it. It's just an older generation. We evolve as people. So what we need to do is just, we need to take this back. And we can do this by concentrating and focusing on this resource called data that, again, nobody's stopping us from diverting our attention somewhere else. Nobody's stopping us from saying, I'm not going to Facebook anymore. Nobody is stopping us. And that's capitalism. So all I'm saying is we have technology, we have this cloud technology that can provide some incredible value. You know, when I first saw a cloud offering, I, I couldn't believe it. I said, well, there's no, why, why even try to compete? Why do you try to create products or services anymore? Because they're just weak incremental steps. It's a new way to share a picture. Now, yeah, great, there's power there. I can, you know, you look at the power of the cloud and the storage and the computing, and it's, it's absolutely amazing. And what I believe we need to do is just take that and tone it back and make it personal. And we talk about a personal cloud here. Personal, if you just imagine a personal cloud is all the power of a cloud for you. So now you have that unbelievable computing power at your fingertips. You know, and we, a lot of us here have already seen this, we, we, we understand, but it's, it's about getting people behind it. You know, we're, we're thought leaders these days, you know. Geeks used to not be thought leaders, right? Now we are. We are, we dictate what comes, what happens. You know, smartphones, 50% US uh, adoption of the, of the smartphone in five years. That's amazing. We did that. Not corporations, it was people. So if we concentrate on taking our data and owning it through any means, such, a person, such as a personal cloud, we can start to really look at what our intentions are. <clears throat> Excuse me, what our intentions are, what our attention is, and how we move things forward. So this personal cloud, if you think about it from the perspective of um, communication is a great, 
is a great uh, introduction to the personal cloud. When a telemarketer calls me, instead of getting my phone, Twilio will route the call to my personal cloud and it will say, geez, look it up in my contact list and say this person isn't known by you. And when that happens, I haven't been notified yet. There's no need for me to be mo notified yet. And my personal cloud handles it and it immediately puts this person into a queue that says if you're willing to, if you're interested in talking to Todd, hey, he's available and his time's worth $15 a minute and here's the credit card prompt. So my personal cloud can take the credit card information from this telemarketer and I get paid for my time. And as soon as we start getting paid for our time, it doesn't matter what that attention is. I gave an example of a phone call as being a, a, a way to put our attention on something. But it's anything. It's a commercial, it's, it's YouTube. Like why, why do we get interrupted with commercials? That's so, it just doesn't even make sense. Like you, you irritate the consumer, the advertiser doesn't get their value out of it. Just show them all to me at one time. I don't need to be interrupted. These things are, you know, this is us taking back our attention. This is us putting forth better technology for people, for, for corporations to still compete. But we slowly grab back some of this attention and intention. Intention is very powerful because if we knew what everybody want, wants and needs, that's their intention, if we knew what they wanted and needed, we could deliver on it. And we can deliver on it in a much better way than the market currently delivers on it. Because these companies guessing at what we need, these companies competing to create products that are ultimately the same, but they're all terrible because one's got the best screen, one's got the best keyboard, one's got the best radio, and in the end, you don't have a full solid product because you have 10 genius scientists trying to create the next best screen, all competing against each other, none of them sharing any of, the, any of their information, and then the winner, it's not winner takes all, it's winner gets to claim that they have the best screen and then nobody else can use it. So now these genius scientists have to go off and figure out different ways to solve the problem. That's, that doesn't sound like to, that doesn't sound like innovation to me. That sounds like inefficiency. And what I'm saying is if we, we just need one screen, right? I mean, I don't, I don't need, you know, one screen for a smartphone, one screen for whatever it is. I don't need any more than that. But corporations, you know, with, through patents and trademarks, they have to, they have to do it this way. This is the game they play, right? And I'm just saying enough's enough. Well, we're sick of playing your game. It's not fun. It creates problems. You know, if you look at the problems of people, you have simple things. When you look at the problems that corporations and, and governments create, this is war. This is genocide. This is terrorism. These are not nice problems. And these are problems that we as people inherit from systems we created. It doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, maybe I'm nuts, but you know, I'm, I'm here talking to, to, to you people because this, again, you're the thought leaders out here. You're the people that are going to take these messages back to your friends, to your family and pass it along. We're trying to do something. At MadeOpen.com, what we're trying to do is we're trying, MadeOpen.com is me. It's one person. And I'm not afraid to admit it. And I work for you. That's it. Who else works for you? I'm trying to figure out what point out into the future we need to get to and I want feedback. This is why I'm here. I'm trying to figure out where we get to and then how we get there. And then within my lifetime make as much progress as I can to that end. Because then at least this way I can tell my kids, hey, I tried, right? I mean, sorry, world sucks, but I tried. I didn't just, you know, do what a lot of people do. Go to work every day and hope things get better. Hope somebody's out there working for me. So I'm looking for people to work with me. I'm looking for ideas and, and, I, and it's not over. I'm, I'm, I want to talk a little more about the personal cloud and what the benefits of that. Because I believe that fundamentally I'm here to talk about the direction and I believe the personal cloud is the first way in which we change that. Because 
again, a per with a personal cloud, that's your data, that's your control. So we just solved the problem of privacy by instituting one simple technology so that you can put all your stuff in one place, see it how you want to see it. So I'll give a couple examples of what, what we can do with a personal cloud. First of all, I, b I believe security becomes a much easier issue. For example, if Facebook try, somebody at Facebook tries to log in ten times into my account guessing passwords, I don't know what Facebook's policy is, but I, I know what my policy would be. And I know you know what your policy would be. And that's more important than what anybody else's policy is. So as soon as you start controlling your data, you make these decisions. You control what happens when somebody comes in to your personal cloud. Right? And this is, a personal cloud is, it's just an abstract idea. There's people working on this. But the idea is it's just an abstract idea of sharing stuff. Again, you have four data types. And all these services, they're spread across. And that right there, you know, this whole API revolution we're seeing, it's not because companies want to share the, their data, right? Their data, not your data. They don't want to share their data with their competition. These are grown men who can't make an agreement, right? These are, it's crazy, but. It's, it's the world we live in and, and these APIs are supposed to give us more access and, and it's neat because yeah, we can do some cool stuff but what if all that stuff was just in one place? What if all your data sat in one location? What could you do with it then? You could do some amazing things because now all your data can talk to each other and it's not about today. You know, today we, we, we live in this moment where we think, wow, look at all this data we're collecting. Right? We're looking at location data, you know, uh, movement data. It's, it's going to get smaller and smaller where it's medical data and embedded devices and wearable devices. And when this happens and we're collecting more and more data, what's enough? You know? How can we make that data intelligently talk to each other? You know, home automation, devices within home automation, not being able to control those. At what point do we get control back? Well, it's when the market demands it. It's when somebody puts something up on some crowdfunding site and gets funded to create something that's open source. I'm saying let's make everything open, right? It's not about this initiative with government to make open government. It doesn't make any sense. They're just opening up more of our data. That's not beneficial to us necessarily. The corporations, I'm sure, are loving it. But it's not for us. What I'm, when I say open, I'm, I, I mean control your data first. Own your data first. Then share it. Then open it, right? Then give it to who you want. Because I, for one, am willing to share everything about myself anonymously to research groups who are trying to solve big problems like cancer, diabetes. You know, let's, let's, I'm willing to tell people what I eat, what my, any, my, my pulse is at any given time, all my vitals, anonymously. Imagine that, what that graph looks like. You know, this is, that's what we're going to be dealing with in a few years. This is not something that's not coming. This is certainly coming. So all I want to do is look out there and say, how are we going to manage this when we get there? How, how are we going to manage this amount of data? How do we take our attention and our intention and start to use it in a way that benefits us instead of them. And I believe if we put options in front of people who know what these things are that I'm talking about, again, this is very little education to take back to your loved ones. Four data types, why are we sharing so much? with so many different people when we only have four things we share. Why don't I have one application for pictures? And then the three tenses to actually start thinking about what, it, what is this data that we're talking about? You know, why is it that we're tricked into always thinking about video images, audio and text? Why isn't it that we, don't, we never think about attention or intention? Where's the privacy policy talk on that? So if we, if we focus on growing something that can manage your attention and your intention through data ownership, such as a personal cloud, then what you do is you have 
the power of your data at your disposal. You can run applications within your own personal cloud, not let anything out. You know, these are, again, smartphone adoption five years. We can do the same thing we did with smartphones. We can do with personal clouds. We have the technology. It's available. You know? So what I'm trying to do is get people behind this movement, get people at Made Open talking about this. I'm going to be much more active leading up to this. Um, I've been doing a lot of work, so I haven't been able to, to be as active on that in the Twitter account. But it's just madeopen.com or at Made Open. And what better than using these social networks to their own demise, right? Let's organize through the resources we have and organize the slow dismantling of these corporations, right? So that we as people can just step out and live our lives and not have to deal with these pressures, these unnatural pressures that people deal with that make them break, you know, that, that create this, this overpopulation in our prisons. And let's fix the efficiencies of these corporations. You know, that, that overpopulation of prisons is a great example of where, where corporations and governments as a system not only fail, but they would leave you believing how this happened. Right? How was it that we have a system, a penal system, where we incarcerate people and it's not profitable, so the market can't take care of it. So government comes in and says, we'll take care of it. And at some point, government says, well, we can't really do this as efficiently as a corporation, so let the corporation do it. So something that wasn't profitable, all of a sudden, became profitable. Is that, it's not even, I mean, in my mind, it's not even possible. Something happened, right? Some numbers were changed. Something happened. And, and this is happening all around us. You don't need to look far to get an example. So the personal cloud. There's a group at, that meets out in Mountain View, California called IIW. And there, there's a big group of people there working on this personal cloud. And I would, you know, implore you to take a look at what they're doing. Um, search about personal clouds and start to become active members of this new community that we're starting to, to form where we're actually concerned about where we're going. And um, that's what Made Open is. So uh, I don't really have too much more that I've prepared to say. So I'd, I'd like questions and feedback. That's what I'd really like to open it up and do. Anybody? Yes, sir. Well, I'm just one person. So if you think about, I mean, technically, I don't know if you're a developer or not, sir, but the, the, the question was how much this personal cloud is done. And there's a bunch of people working on it. They've been working on it, I think, for six or seven years at IIW. And the interesting thing to me when you sit in these sessions is you, you can tell it's, they're guided by principles that you, you're happy to hear about, right? Liberating people's data. That's a great thing. But almost the next question out of their mouth is how do we make money? And that's where it's lost on somebody. That's where you can't make progress because you're still trying to figure out how do we give this personal cloud to somebody in its entirety so they can own their data yet we still control it. And you can't. And it doesn't fit a business. It's not supposed to fit a business model. This is for the people. Right? This is something we need several open source versions of personal clouds where people are working on a platform to do this. And it doesn't take a lot to create a simple personal cloud. If you look at what, you know, AWS, for example, what they're giving us is tools. Now, the setup process isn't easy, but this is what we're used to. This is, you know, we can't just tell people here, install this software, you know, go to AWS, set up an account, you know, and here's how you upload. Here's, here's how you manage your, you know, your settings and all that. It's not going to work. Like, this is, that's not a commercial product. So we need to create a per commercial product, but that always starts here. You know, what is Dropbox but FTP, right? Like, we do these things over and over and over again until the point where one of us 
figures out a way to make money with it and it's always simplifying it so that the user can manage it. So, you know, we need to grab onto this thing called a personal cloud and what, what better time? I'm sure a lot of people are already doing something similar to it. But the point is to share. How are you protecting your data? You know, how are you encrypting it? What level of uh, privacy can we expect when it ultimately gets to somewhere else? When we decide that we don't, you know, when I make the decision that I don't need to own my data the same way that somebody else does. You know, and I'm willing to say, okay, you know what? Amazon can have that and I'm not going to encrypt it. It's not that important. Or I encrypt it and lock it in a closet in my house. Right? But it's up to you. Your personal cloud is your personal cloud. It's your data. And so to answer your question, there's, it's, there's progress. But it's more important that just like with a personal computer, it's like there's a computer and it's in a room. It's huge. And now it's in our pocket. You know, same thing with a personal cloud. It's, the idea is huge. We're doing it though. You know, this is, it's not new. So it's, the idea is to take that, put it in our pocket. Product called Own Cloud, yeah. And there's some. There's definitely. You, when you look at these products, there's. You know, you want to just look at what the limitations are. Who's owning your data, and you know, and move from there. Because there are going to be putting all our data in one place is not. This is where we're going as a people. Like we need to get our data in one place. The question just is, who are we going to trust with it? Yep. Right. So um, if I can sum that question up, uh, touched on there being public data that we need to, we need to think about and I agree that it's not all personal but ultimately it is collected by people. So um, there was that and then um, can you sum up the second part? I'm sorry. Can you sum it up? Right. Okay. So. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. So basically, taking that data and making things more efficient through through its use, right? And, and yeah, absolutely. And and that public data that exists out there, that that's ours, you know. And that's it's really not ours right now. Like, it's not a well. It is. I mean. It is individual because where else is the weather or whatever relevant but to me where I am or where I intend to be or where I know people to be that I'm interested in, right? It, it's all the personal, you know, without people on this planet, the rainfall does not get, you know, calculated and, and you know, like historically saved and it just, it is what it is. Like we as people, you know, we want to know out of, for convenience reasons because we have the intention to leave our house tomorrow if it's going to rain. But you know, some of us don't care if it rains. So public data, it, it, again, it's what is necessary for you. And there's always that need for, you know, for us to have some kind of system. But again, it's a system of the people. You know, it's a system where you control that data, where you hold on to that and do what you see fit with it. You know, I believe we're 
we're owed these things just for being alive. I mean, what's more amazing than life on this planet? It's, you know, we're spinning on this rock in the middle of nowhere and we're fighting with each other over money. Like all just things we've created. So, you know, just trying to organize uh, some troops here. I got any other questions? Good. All right. Well, I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me at DEF CON. It's been a great first time. And I look forward to talking with you out in the hall. Thank you. <laughs>